Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Experts Online. My name is Nicola, and I will be your moderator for today. I am a clinical specialist here at Medal headquarters in Innsbruck, Austria, and part of the Image Guided Surgery Group at R&D. So before we start with our speakers for today, um, here are a couple of housekeeping technical uh, tips and tricks in order to make the quality of this session the best possible. So first of all, we would like to ask you to name yourself uh, with your name, organization, and country that you're coming from, similar as we do in the conferences in order to know who is who in this uh, session. You can do that by right-clicking on your name and renaming. Furthermore, to avoid any background noise, please mute your microphone if you don't speak and mute your phone as well. And later on, if you have any questions after the talks of our experts, you can always unmute or type in the chat your questions. In order to have a stable internet connection, we recommend you to uh, turn off all the other programs that you're not using at the moment as they might affect the internet bandwidth on your side. And uh, as I mentioned, this is a, an interactive session and we encourage you to write comments, ask questions um, after the, the, the official um, presentations. Um, for easy understanding, we also provide uh, English captioning, and by pressing on the closed caption button um, in your Zoom window, you can enable those and um, have it visible at all time. Okay, so once again, the topic of uh, today's session is the image-guided surgery. My name is Nicola, and we have two uh, excellent speakers, uh, experts in the field of image-guided surgery. We have Professor Veda Topsakal from Belgium. He is the head of ENT department at the University Hospital of Brussels and professor at the Free University in Brussels. And he will be talking about Autoplan and how he utilizes Autoplan as a part of his clinical routine. And furthermore, we have uh, Professor Marco Cavasaccio from Switzerland. He is the ENT clinical director and chairman at the Department for Otolaryngology, had an neck surgery at the Inserspital in Bern, and um, he will be talking about how robotics fits into the future clinical workflow. Before we proceed uh, with our speakers, uh, I would kindly ask you to um, participate in our Mentimeter uh, questionnaire. So you can use your phone and scan the QR code in the top left of your uh, screen, or just go to menti.com and enter the code. You can use your phone or um, your computer. And let's uh, let's just see how um, um, how you perform and if you are performing imaging preoperatively for your cochlear implant candidates, just to get a feeling of, of our audience uh, as the topic of imaging um, will be quite present in the upcoming minutes. Okay. So are you performing CT, CBCT scans, preoperatively MRIs, or both CT MRIs, or none, or something else, maybe an x-ray? Okay, let's wait a couple of more seconds. I think this is quite clear, okay. Um, let me proceed to the next question. Post-operatively, what kind of imaging are you performing on um, your patients, your implantees, if you are performing any? Again, we have the CT, CBCT, um, X-rays, both CT and X-rays, other kind of imaging or none. I think we had nine in the previous school. Let's see if we get that. Yes, okay. Okay, so most of you are performing also post-operatively CT and CPC. Excellent, thank you very much. We have one more stop before we proceed to the talks of our experts. From the medical perspective, when we talk about image-guided surgery, we think the first thing we think is the Autoplan and Hero. These are, uh, medical devices uh, produced in collaboration with Castination, a Swiss company. 
where Medel is the partner in development and uh, exclusive distributor of these. Um, Autoplan, next slide. Thank you. So Autoplan is a surgical planning software for general autology. It uses standard medical imaging, CT, CBCT, MRI. So um, uh, imaging modalities that, that um, you were just voting for. So uh, nothing dedicated or special is needed in order to um, upload to this software. And it's PACS ready. So you can always connect it to your hospital PACS system and pull the data directly from it. Key features of Autoplan are the 3D reconstruction of anatomical structures, um, preoperative CI and BCI planning, uh, post-operative analysis also possible, and um, the image fusion. So you are able to fuse the images of different modalities and get the best out of, out of each. Uh, besides regular clinical workflow, which, which Professor Topsicle will be talking about, uh, Autoplan is also used and utilized in, in patient counseling, research, and teaching purposes. Um, the thing I would also like to mention is C Mart and FDA approved. And currently we are rolling out the latest version of Autoplan in uh, markets accepting the CE mark. The Hiero system that I mentioned on my one of the previous slides is the robotic system for cochlear implantation. Um, it uses optical navigation to, to track the patient and uh, instruments. And until now it has been used in seven clinics in Europe uh, in more than 50 uh, cases. So more than 50 patients were treated with this system. And again, we will hear more about it from, from our speakers in the upcoming minutes. The HERO procedure consists of, of four main steps. One is the first one is the surgical planning, which is done on autoplan software. Um, then there is the middle ear access, inner ear access, and electrode insertion. And the procedure that we have today, uh, we have thanks to our, our experts who will be talking today. Uh, Professor Marco Cavasaccio was the first to perform the middle ear access with the, the robotic system, and Professor Veda Topsakal uh, was the first to perform the inner ear access. He extended work of, of Professor Cavasaccio, and uh, we use this procedure now um, in all other hospitals as well. At this point, I would like to hand it over to Professor Veda Topsakal, um, who will give us more insights about Autoplan and how Autoplan fits into his clinical routine and how it's used. Professor Topsakal, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Nicola, also for your kind introduction. Uh, my name is indeed Veda Topsakal. I work in Brussels, and uh, I would like to thank also Medel and the steering committee of these online sessions for inviting me together with Professor Cavazaccio it's really an honor to speak also um, about our, let's say, first experiences of Otto plan. I, I guess we could say we were uh, early adopters to this, uh, to this um, new technology. And I have to recognize in this my colleagues from Antwerp. Um, you see here Professor Paul van der Heining, who uh, I pulled into robotic surgery <laughs> before he was retiring. But he was also one of the first to say that Autoplan should be a standalone in clinical workflow because this tool is also of benefit of uh, general autology on itself and not only for robotic and image guided surgery as you spoke about just a minute ago. So I have to recognize also Giet Mertens on the right side who did a lot of, uh, let's say, audiological, electrophysiological work with Autoplan tools together. And also Vincent was very supportive in Antwerp. Now, one of the first things we already, um, I have to admit a lot of people into this meeting. Uh, let's see if I can proceed to the next slide. Yes, uh, one of the first things we would uh, have to acknowledge that Autoplan puts our nose to the fact that not every cochlea has the same size. Um, this means that uh, Maybe somebody else can let in all the other uh, listeners. Um, this means that when you have the high, you know, the jet set technology to image the cochleas, uh, you should also recognize that you know one size of an electrode array does not fit all. Uh, so uh, this was one of the first works. I think it was one of the first versions of Autoplan, maybe even a research version where we, um, with our research group in Antwerp, try to find out what is the inter-observer or even intra observer variability of dimensions of the cochlea we could measure and was this feasible for clinical um, purposes and we could conclude that it was feasible for clinical purposes 
So from there on, we continued. And immediately a new study came up into our minds. I mean, we took, uh, let's say about 50 consecutive cases from our clinics where we placed the flex 28 electrode. Because in those times we had the idea that 50% of all cochleas were on average covered with uh, 28 millimeter because of the early work of Hardy that she measured the cochlear duct lengths. But it, it turned out not to be really true because if you look at these 50 consecutive cases, you can see that some of these cochleas were um, even shorter. So here we had with the flex 28, a rather deep insertion. And whereas the cochleas were longer, we had a rather shallow insertion. And if we looked at those um, data together with Griet Merkens, um, and that time I have to also say that Ottoplan um, was really in a version that we needed to find uh, together with Griet Mertens, the electrodes in the cochlea, depict them and point them out and segment them, so to say. But I will get back to that in the latest version of Ottoplan. We could conclude that, yeah, um, there's more frequency shift when there is a, a more shallow or less deeper insertion. And keep this in mind, because um, also our latest research uh, on this topic hints towards the same. Well, what does that mean? If, if you also look at these data sets, um, the, the, the lesser the frequency shift is, um, actually also the better the, the speech and noise scores were. And, and this is not a new finding. In these series, we could also only substantiate this for the first six months with the ABF we did, but it is also known in literature that you know, the deeper the insertion is, the more cochlear coverage you have, the better um, outcomes you could have, or let's say uh, speech performance you can have from your cochlear implantation. So it's a bit um, surprising that uh, not all manufacturers jump on this, but you can see the, the, the gamma of, uh, let's say the portfolio of all manufacturers, how much they cover of the cochlea. And you see here also uh, a little bit of a outdated slide, but because in between, the medal portfolio has been extended with the Flex 26 even. So the manufacturer supplies what we would what we would demand for, but what is in demand? And this is something is that's a decision between you and, and of course your patient and how your patient pre presents uh, itself with the hearing loss. Again, that, that fact I will come back to. Another clinical study we actually are performing uh, on, at this moment, very moment right now, is that we also look into the ossicles with Ottoplan. I mean, Ottoplan provides also information on other temporal bone structures. And one of the uh, things you could measure is the height of the stapes. Again, here it was with the oldest version that we have to, let's say, segment or point out three points of the stapes, and it could give us the height of the stapes. Why would that be important? Well, of course, the people who are into stapes surgery, it's always a, a, a bit of a burden uh, to measure the length of, of the stapes or the length of the prosthesis you would want to choose. Uh, we took, let's say, uh, 90 consecutive cases of, of my predecessor, Professor Franz Kortz, and uh, we measured uh, on the preoperative scan, because he always performed the preoperative scan with Ottoplan, the height of these tapices, and you can see a quite normal distribution with the average length on around four millimeter. And we also looked at what he um, measured and placed. Unfortunately, not all the operation reports um, report on the fact what he measured, but it also was for us surprising to see that he had a, let's say, preference for a 5.2 fish prosthesis, which he used most of the time. So this was a bit of a skewed distribution. Um, it only, only shows that Ottoplan is quite accurate in measuring the length, and it was also reassuring to me that my preference as a stapes surgery is, is a 4.6 millimeter prosthesis of a called the loop that I cut. So here you see the normal distribution and the benefits. It just shows that Ottoplan, you know, you just need to use your imagination, but it can do more to your otological surgery um, besides image-guided surgery or co even cochlear implant surgery. Coming back to um, the latest version, um, here you see how fast it could go if your Ottoplan system is connected to your packs that you can, let's say, upload or download, whatever you want to say, take the images from your patch system and put them on Ottoplan. This is really faster than in the beginning days where we had to really, uh, unfortunately, 
go to radiology and connect the device. All these efforts are there to make us a bit of bit more independent of the radiology department. We can do this now ourselves. We don't need to, uh, you know, uh, be a burden to radiologists and please ask and demand. No, no. Even our audiologists can do this. Our residents can do this in training. Now. In the next slide, you see something very spectacular. I mean, um, this is the newest version of Autoplan that really segments the crucial anatomy fully automated. I mean, you can say it's a calculating algorithm. You can say it's artificial intelligence, intelligence, whatever you want. But it's for sure something that has less inter or intra observer variability. So it really outperforms our first study and it outperforms the let's say human segmentation of dimensions and the calculations of the cochlear duct length because it's based on a, a mathematical formula to, to depict the points for the calculation and it does every time the same or with a much more higher accuracy. And this is perhaps a game changer. Uh, not only does it require any more a radiologist or a trained autologist, no, audiologist can do this. Uh, but it's also a game changer on a different dimension. I will get back to that as well in a minute. It also gives you the possibility, the Autoblend version, to show or put in uh, the data of your audiogram. And you see on the left corner a cochlea, that is a normal hearing cochlea. But you see in within the picture centrally, you see um, the audiogram we put in, there is a, a high frequency hearing loss, there is some residual hearing. Uh, there that was represented by the intensity of the colors and the, and the frequencies are uh, represented by the, the, the colors that are changing. Huh? So this is a 3D audiogram that you can put in. Why would we want to give you this feature? Well, for the basic reason that it's also up to you together with your patient to decide which length are you going to use. You know, it's not that you measure 32 millimeters and you say, okay, I can fit in the flex soft. No, no. The residual hearing is also a parameter that you need to discuss with your patient. What do you want? You know, your hearing loss is perhaps very, very progressive. So, okay, you have some residual hearing here, but probably it will be gone next year or in within two years. We will go for a full coverage and a full length. Or you will say, no, your hearing uh, loss has been stable over the last 15 years. Maybe we can uh, we can even uh, try to preserve that hearing loss, or even if it is if a better residual hearing, we can go for electroacoustic stimulation. These are all very nice counseling. To, uh, I mean, moments, and you can use the Autoplan as a tablet or even on your desktop together uh, uh, with your um, instruments in your outpatient clinics to counsel and to see what that patient wants and what would be the best for that patient. Now. Other new features are also that you can um, segment where the implant placement is. Uh, why is that important? Well, it's another, let's say, standardization or quality parameter, especially in bilateral cases. You know, you can uh, try to work as symmetrically as possible because these are the smallest things that the patients really very much appreciate. Another very nice feature is you can fuse images, the pre-op and the post-op CT, but you can also fuse the MR images with the CT. So um, as I said before, use your imagination because this tool is too powerful to think of um, whatever possibilities there are in, in terms of research to pursue actually better care for our patients. Um, the electrode detection, I pointed out in the beginning, which we did manually, now is also uh, fully automated. And this um, enables an audiologist to um, segment post-operatively where all the electrodes are and even continue with anatomy-based fitting. Not only that, it also detects the implant and it could be in the near future that uh, your audiologists say, oh, yeah, but you should take care of the fact that you should perhaps uh, guard uh, two centimeters between the implant housing and your mastoidectomy or, you know, another parameter to standardize the surgical outcomes uh, to help us to perform even better care for our patients. In terms of anatomy-based fitting, I have to apologize for the chaotic slide here, but these are very, very preliminary results of the um, uh, limited numbers of cases. We've put five um, patients into a study in a randomized controlled trial, actually, with anatomy-based fitting, and we compared them to conventionally fitted cases. 
And all of the slides you can see in, in pure tone average, but also speech in quiet and speech in noise, perhaps not so much, but there is an overlapping moment. So as I said in the first slides, in our first studies, um, the deeper the insertion, the more cochlear coverage you have, the better the performance. It also shows here that anatomy-based uh, fitting probably is even more likely to, to perform better when you have at least um, over 600 degrees of insertion. Again, this is only an effect for, let's say, the first six months of follow-up we have, but we want to enlarge this group and we will surely get back to you with these data in the near future. Now, to come back to why Autoplan was designed, it was designed to enable image-guided surgery. Also, this we've studied, and I have to admit that I did my share of supramental approaches. Um, we also compared that how the trajectory or the insertion angles would be uh, when you compare to the uh, more, more, let's say, uh, standardized or the golden standard of posterior tympanotomy. Um, yes, um, for the moment, you have to enter the cochlea through the round window. We don't perform any cochleostomies anymore. And you have to try to stay as long as parallel uh, as possible with the basal turn. Well, if you define it like that, the facial nerve is in your way, so you have to adjust it. Now, it's one thing that the surgeon segments all the anatomical structures, but with the latest version, we have now Autoplan that's fully segmenting the 3D um, anatomy of that case. So it makes another leap towards the future. It may even facilitate uh, a leap from, let's say, uh, in terms of uh, level A3 autonomy, that where the surgeon segments and supervises the trajectory, that uh, autopilot now is at level uh, A4 of high level autonomy, where surgeons only approve the trajectory. And I'm sure Professor Kawasaki is going to tell you about what is a safe trajectory, but I just want to point out that Autoplan with the latest version and the automated algorithm is just another step forwards to uh, standardize higher uh, care or a higher level of care to standardize also our outcomes. So to summarize, it really is a tool to, to provide you with uh, parameters for individualized, custom-made, tailored cochlear implantation for your patients. Uh, next to that, also Nicola nicely pointed out, it's also good for counseling pre- and post-operatively, but it's also good for teaching for your residents. It allows a fully and independent analysis of CT scans, regardless of the background of the healthcare worker. So an anatomist can upload uh, easily the images and come back with the plan for anatomy-based fitting. Um, the new version is actually quite fun and quite self-teaching. This was in a very short uh, amount of time what I could uh, share with you. I would like to thank you again for your invitation and uh, show you my disclosures and thank Medel. Thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you so much, Professor Topsagal, for this comprehensive um, presentation, not just only on Autoplan, but uh, the journey through through the whole uh, topic of robotics and, and your experience with it, um, highly appreciated. Um, I guess, I don't know if we don't have any questions yet, but uh, at, at the end of the session, we can, I'm sure we'll have some and, and uh, we can answer them. Thank you, thank you um, again. Um, let's switch to um, our next uh, expert, uh, Professor Marco Cavasaccio. Um, who will, I'm sure, um, extend the, the, what, what Professor Topsakal already mentioned and give us some more insights into how, how robotic surgery fits in, in the current and future clinical workflow. Um, Professor Kawasaccio, please. Thank you very much, Nicola. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Topsakal, we will start. I have uh, moved here a little bit again. Um, no. Okay, my topic is uh, this afternoon is uh, it's a little the robot and especially the computer assisted ear surgery. I start with uh, computer assisted surgery. First of all, I'm from Bern, from Switzerland. Uh, we have disclosure and acknowledgement that you can read on the right side, uh, supported by different uh, institution from Switzerland for European Union as well from uh, Medel. 
When you look about the evolution of image guided surgery, you can look about, especially on the lateral skull base, that uh, often they are not very often used because we have uh, is a delicate structure and we have not a high precision on uh, this image guided surgery. One of the first about navigation surgery was in Freiburg in Breisgau, uh, where they have started to use it for a cochlear implantation this then more than 15 years ago. Why we have this uh, not too much used image guided surgery on the lateral skull base, it depends a little bit on the tracking modality on the different camera that you can see what we have at the moment is this Cambiar B1, is this this one, this Axio 3D, where it's really low 0.1 millimeter. We have this uh, CT slide thickness, where is now uh, better, and the different registration modes, uh, methods, as you can see, and we have a high precision, high accuracy, especially when you have bone screws. Uh, uh, when you look about what we have today, uh, we have on the microscope, you have the possibility to make an injection in one of uh, this, uh, um, uh, what I mean in the in inside the imaging, uh, and you can visualize uh, not only the CT scan, but you can also look about uh, segmentation, what you have performed before. What you see here is one of the segmentation uh, technology of the brain uh, lab system, as you can see, you can uh, show here at the essence of the superior canal, you can also make a, pl a plan on the different ossicle visible here in green, and uh, to look around in 3D reconstruction of the head. This is what you find at the moment uh, on a CT scan, and especially you can also make a fusion of CT MR and the segmentation uh, technology that we can use inside the microscope for navigation on the lateral skull base. Another possibility is, in fact, also the last uh, 10, 15 years to make endoscope middle ear navigation. We have started uh, with this one, with a tracking camera. Patient tracker is like a satellite dish uh, and uh, to use it uh, for some experiments uh, during surgery that we can visualize this uh, not only on the microscope, uh, but also in the endoscope and on the monitor. Here you can see the different possibilities the, to visualize on 3D, on the CT scan, the exact position of the middle ear, the promontorium, the round window, the corda tympani, and so on. And I will quickly show you this uh, on a video, the endoscopic middle ear navigation, what we have performed together with uh, our co-worker, Professor Lukas Anschutz here in Bern, to look about what is also possible because the topic is here be, uh, during this session is also robo uh, not only robotic surgery, but also computer-aided surgery and because computer-aided surgery is in, since 1996, it is also possible to make a computer-aided surgery on uh, endoscopic surgery. It's clear we have already seen by Professor Aveda Topsakal uh, uh, interoperative imaging, uh, the X uh, cat that you can see it here. And uh, what is necessary, what you have seen just before, is a satellite dish, in fact, or a dynamic a reference base. Um, and here, what is the data you can hear, you can make then the, the segmentation <clears throat> to visualize on this autoplan system. This is the elder version, it's not the newest one, 4.0. Zero here, especially for the facial nerve uh, uh, to visualize here in yellow visible. We perform this with a medical engineer. This is also important as well uh, with a radiologist. Uh, here, this is only to visualize. This is uh, cholesteatoma surgery, endoscopic surgery. These are new ideas what we have uh, for the future to integrate and uh, navigation. It's clear what is important is also that you have at the tip is uh, perhaps 0.5 millimeters, especially the registration technology that you have seen in the beginning that the best thing is to do this on screws. And here you can then visualize on one monitor where you are exactly, this is for middle ear surgery, round window approach uh, that you can see it uh, here. Here the different structure is also visualized here on 3D on the right side. Uh, 
and you, it's clear you can uh, do endoscopic surgery with a drill. Here is the star base ahead uh, that you can uh, visualize uh, on uh, this uh, screen. These are the different possibilities uh, that also in the future, not only in microscopy can make a navigation surgery, it's also the possibility to make endoscopically. It's clear not uh, these are prototypes and it's not worldwide that uh, you can see something like this. Uh, another thing is uh, what is also a little bit in Innsbruck is this robotics scope. This is a paradigma change that you can uh, move a little bit uh, your camera. You can make uh, imaging mode, focus, uh, preview. This is another possibility of robotic surgery where we enter now in the detail in the uh, next uh, 15 minutes. Uh, this is uh, one possibility not only to use in the uh, for uh, surgery, but as well for moving uh, system, like here, the, uh, the robotic scope. Uh, it's also possible today uh, to make uh, on the exoscope uh, surgery. Here you can we, uh, show you where we perform this on uh, uh, middle ear uh, surgery with this robotic scope. Now move to the robotic uh, surgery. And you have seen uh, one of the last slides from Professor Veda Topsakal is a bit, a bit the same, where we are speaking what, what we do normally for robot. Uh, we are often, uh, and what is uh, accepted worldwide is a little bit robot assistance. And what we perform at the moment is a certain task autonomy, what I will show you with the hero system. It's clearly in the market, you have also Da Vinci that you use more in DNT. Area, especially for the tours, that's a role robotic surgery for, in fact, for the, the base of the tongue or the, uh, something like a pharyngectomy. You can perform this uh, uh, with uh, Da Vinci. But the, the, especially for the skull base as well uh, for uh, the ear surgery, we cannot use this uh, Da Vinci system. But what we do is robot assistance with a certain task autonomy. This is uh, level two. Is uh, this was proposition is in fact uh, uh, from 90, uh, 2017 uh, is from Russell Taylor. When we look about uh, the robot system, uh, when we perform a surgery for cochlear implantation, it, the question is if we make a tunnel procedure, a keyhole procedure. Or we do it like uh, for machine, a CAT CAM technique, computer assisted design uh, to make a mastodectomy. And uh, what we see, uh, there are other groups worldwide that have started to look about uh, uh, controlled robotic only for uh, mastoidectomy. And also possible, but only is remaining still at the certain uh, cadaver level is the, to go to the inner auditory canal for small acoustic uh, neuroma surgery. But until now, we have no robot uh, that can be used uh, in clinics. When we look about uh, now what is important, what was already mentioned uh, by Professor Topsakal, it's very important, the planning system. Because without planning, you can perform nothing. It's the same when you use Tesla, when you have chatbot, when you like you now, uh, big data management, artificial intelligence, etc., is all going in the software. But this need time and this need also uh, that you, you're looking a little bit what can offer you the system. Then the robotic middle ear access, the inner ear access, and what is important, especially when you hear for the step four, the robotic inner ear access, is for hearing preservation. And I will show you here a little bit uh, what is already on the different market. Uh, one of the first was uh, Professor Lavadi from the Vanderbilt uh, University who have started 2008, eight, then uh, watching the industrial robot with Machdani and uh, Crutchman uh, take over from the US uh, to the Hanover School. Uh, Lavadi, Rob has performed 2014 and presented laryngoscope uh, nine cases, uh, what, we have, uh, what he has performed with the stereotactic uh, system, what you can use, uh, see it. They've also used a planning system. It's clear to plan this. Uh, this was one of this procedure. Again, it's a keyhole procedure. It's important. The Hanover, Hanover group have uh, make also a different cadaver study with this robot chick. It's a little bit 
uh, yeah, it resembles a little bit what, the, what it was performed in the US. Uh, and they have also made uh, some uh, publication uh, at the moment, uh, but they have not used it uh, completely in uh, human. Another system is the ROSA robot system. Is one uh, they used is used uh, often for neurosurgery, and uh, they have made five cases. Uh, unfortunately, like uh, also the group in the in the US, they have had the problem with the facial nerve, uh, and uh, in this program they have stopped it. On the other one, on the US, what they have had is more. Uh, a high-speed drill and the high-speed drill they have not to touch the nerve but what they have performed is the high the 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 the, the heat has damaged the, the the facial nerve but transitory what i know from the us but in this case they have reached in fact the facial nerve and therefore uh, it's very important to have a high precision for the robot system there exists another one is this robot tool from france from nbn and uh, especially from oliver sterker where this machine can perform different things. Uh, you can use it as endoscope holder. You can make laser surgery of star based uh, surgery, but you can also use it for introduction of the electrode inside uh, the cochlea, especially when you have uh, cases with hearing preservation. And here you see also the, the possibility were used by uh, Yan Gen to use it for middle ear surgery but they can also use it uh, not only for middle ear surgery, but then also for cochlear implantation. And he has made also a proposition uh, uh, to use it uh, when uh, to use it for transcanal robot-based endoscopy uh, when it not works with uh, transmetal normal dichotomy and uh, in uh, microscope robot-based endoscopy. <clears throat> When you have looked about uh, the holder, especially when you want to use it for the future uh, for endoscopic surgery, and this uh, we perform a lot of hybrid te technology also in here in Bern, it, it's clear you will find more and more new prototype for endoscope holder. And we have also looked about endoscope holder also in Bern, not only for the nose, what you can see here is also the one of this prototype, but you can also use it not only on the nose, but also on the uh, ear. And here, then uh, you can move it. Uh, uh, this is all, it's, all, it's only a head holder. Here uh, is the ear and you can use it. The only problem what we have is that he's four millimeters or three millimeters and we have not enough place, but it could be also helpful for the future. When we go now back to the cochlear implantation, what we can look about uh, is uh, a different group worldwide. One was also for the UK in the Birmingham and London technology, where Peter uh, Brett has looked about uh, to drill for the cochleostomy on human cadavers. Cochleostomy, or what we want is to have for hearing preservation round window approach. But this is very important. One of these uh, uh, group also in Birmingham, they have looked about uh, also for robotic cochlear implantation. Now, another philosophy is only from the US, is, is Hansen and especially Bruce Gans in Iowa. They named this also IOTA, IOTA or IOVA motion. They concentrate them only on the last step. We have had four steps and one was uh, for hearing preservation. They use this uh, technology to put in with 0.1 millimeter per second to 0.3 millimeter per second to put in the electrode in still hearing person. And I think this uh, is, could be one possibility to concentrate on this robot on the last step. And uh, what is also important that uh, not only this group uh, have looked about this, but what is also possible in the future is to look uh, to put in electrocochlography together with this robotic assisted uh, machine or array. And this could, uh, especially for normal anatomy, uh, could be helpful and is especially for hearing preservation technology. And you see here one of a uh, cadaver head, but I have also started what I had noticed uh, from the US also uh, on the clinical side. 
There is another group in Poland. They have used this only for uh, cochlear implantation for still hearing uh, preservation technology with the robot hall in Poland, what you can see on the right side. Now, uh, go back a little bit uh, what we have performed. The auto plan you have already heard. This is really the basic. When we don't make a plan system, forget it. Don't make nothing, but it's sometimes it's time consuming, and it, but it gives you some standardization, selection of optimal electrode, and it's gradually you have then the different possibility to measure here the conducting duct length. Another possibility is also we have semi-automatic segmentation. This means you have some interference by a medical engineer, but what you have seen is also possible to make a complete automatic one, but Again, but it also must be an error inside. Someone must know what kind of algorithms are inside. It's clear one of the challenges is this accuracy, and especially when you make this keyhole procedure, what is performed with the robot hole, what is performed with the, with the Yota motion, they make a completely normal mastoidectomy, and they don't go through this challenge, this special quarter recess. And in this case, we have uh, about 2.5 uh, to 3 millimeter. And it's clear during the surgery, you have these different steps. Step one to the posterior tympanotomy, step two, then you go through it. And step three, you will touch then the endoster. And step four is the insertion, what also the other group, especially for hearing preservation, will perform. Auto plan, you have uh, already heard about by Professor Topsaka. It's very important to look about this. What I can only say is the quarter tympany, you cannot every time visualize on the CT. You make an extra uh, extrapolation, in fact, uh, to go through because sometimes it's not visible also to see it on a CT scan. And it's clear here you can make all the calculation to the facial nerve, this distance, especially to have a, a good uh, trajectory and optimize. And it's clear what we have already seen is the fitting strategy post-operatively to have a look about this, to see where are the different uh, platins, uh, to have stimulation of these 12 electrodes, what you can see here uh, on the right side. Because also perhaps also in the future, it perhaps you can replace it, the CT scan, with this impedance based insertion depth estimation, but we will see it in the future if it's possible to exclude the CT scan postoperatively. Here is the drill bit where we go through is 1.8 millimeters. And what we have also is the probe. This is the facial nerve monitoring in the keyhole procedure. We cannot use a normal uh, nerve integrating monitoring what is, uh, what is uh, coming uh, from other companies. So the question is over the, uh, the neuro monitoring, what is safe, what is not safe near the facial nerve. We know that this is more than uh, 0.6 is 95%. Uh, not safe is clearly 0.1 millimeter. The question is 0.3, 0.4 is enough. It depends a little bit uh, what I told you was on the electricity on the bone. It depends on the heat, uh, what is the, the temperature on the bone, and especially if you have vessels around the facial nerve. But this is uh, one question. And also perhaps in the future, instead to have a, a 1.8 millimeter, you have a drill bit of 1.5 millimeter. This is only one of the first what we have performed uh, uh, operation is only to go to the inner ear access. This will be, you see it, uh, we drill it, but with a 1.8 millimeter, we drill it and uh, we uh, drill it away, this canyon or the overhanging to the round window. This is also uh, possible as a control under the endoscope here. Good. And what is important is this guide uh, tube prototype that you can see it, especially the shoe. It's like a shoe where you can put in the electrode completely in the inner ear. It's here, it's really rapidly. It's not 0.1 millimeter per second uh, to don't destroy the scala tympani and to enter the scala vestibuli. But it's now better. Huh? Uh, here we have performed 2016 the, the first operation on it. Uh, we have looked about uh, tra the trajectory length, about the rapid prototype, uh, and have measured uh, all of what is uh, 
too much and what is normally the distance. But when you have a tunnel to the inner is about what you can uh, see it here is about 24 uh, millimeters, sometimes it's 26 millimeters. The question is also if you must change it, also the, the CI, uh, the, uh, the size, et cetera, and the uh, excess of the lead loop, uh, what you can see it here. Uh, what is also must mention is uh, sometimes when you have a, a neck who is too small, etc., it's very difficult to use here the XCAT. It exists now, the large one, what is used also in uh, by Professor Topsakal. Uh, and but in this case, you have stopped the operation because you have not had the control during surgery. Here on the left side, you see a normal conventional one. Then on the on the other side was performed a robotic drilled tunnel. Here the CT scan, uh, normal uh, mastoidectomy on the left side, and on the right side uh, you see this uh, tunnel procedure. What is also important, perhaps also for the future, is the uh, what kind of endoscope we can use. As you know, we make uh, till now a tympanometal flap. Uh, they have looked also what kind of uh, endoscope we can use. Uh, we have the CL endoscope. We can also use chip on the tip, road lens, microscope, and also to look about the quality, what you can have uh, with your endoscope. Uh, they have used also pediatric ureteroscope uh, uh, below one millimeter, but the people People who made uh, cell endoscopy know exactly that we have a low resolution since many years and we have not a high quality of resolution. You can also look about uh, how to control it, the endoscopic control of the CI path uh, through the middle ear. It gives you a little bit more information about uh, the middle ear. It's not necessary, but it gives you more anatomical information. Here they have looked about uh, uh, to reduce the lead diameter as well, the lead length uh, to have uh, not uh, excess uh, lead uh, loop. Uh, here you see then one patient has had uh, a very good result in this case. Uh, uh, here the results of the uh, first clinical trial have stopped uh, three cases in this, uh, but you, when you look about the target error, and this is important, it must be below 0.5 millimeters. And uh, I've also looked about that we have a good distance, uh, facial nerve distance of 0.5 millimeters. It's clear perhaps you can go, go a little bit more low. This is mean is o, plus minus 0.25. This mean in one case, we were about 0.3 millimeter from the facial nerve. What we see is here is the duration. It's clear it's still uh, on ongoing work. We need a lot of time for the planning system, patient preparation, local anesthesia and imaging guidance. We have had uh, four hours. We know that some groups has only have 2.5 hours and I think this is very good, but we have integrated a lot of safety procedure as you have seen with uh, intraoperative uh, CT scan. We have medical engineer peer group. We have neuroradiologists as uh, intraoperatively. And that was mentioned uh, at the beginning by Nicola and Professor Veda Topsakal is the inner ear approach, what they have already uh, shown you. But what you have now is a one millimeter uh, bird, a diamond that you can have, and you can uh, drill away. In fact, uh, here the overhanging or the cannon, as was mentioned by Vedat, uh, to open here and going uh, to the inner ear. Huh? This is the mean uh, the step three to go inside. Here is also on the control of the endoscope. You must change a little bit the head because normally endoscopic surgery you perform on a flat head. When you make a uh, microscope search, it's more on uh, hyperextension. Here, this is this uh, uh, visualization again of this uh, round window of approach. Uh, you can measure the four step that you see on the top, and you know exactly when you reach then the membrane of the round window. We have also looked about children. Theoretically, it's possible because, uh, but what you can see, the screw is a very big one. And this is uh, one of this uh, problem what we have. We have also not, it's clearly not cut our head for, for, uh, of children that we can use it uh, to make uh, some experiments. Uh, 
we have also what is important when you look about operation of young children, the cochlear angle and the random wing angle is not the same when you operate a child of four months than uh, an adult of 20 years old. Then was uh, the 2020, the medal, calcination, the hero one. Uh, one thing I show you here, uh, uh, 30 years ago was one man, one show, uh, or the one goal. Today you have one team, one goal. You must integrate it, medical engineer, uh, anesthesia staff, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This means you have more and more people in the, in the OR and preoperatively than perhaps 30 years ago. We have also performed the clinical triple trials uh, and I show you one uh, of this operation. Uh, we have this advanced autosclerosis. Uh, we have on one side was operated with a CI and especially was ready to have a direct acoustic cochlear stimulation. And on the left side, you see a destroyed inner ear of the cochlea with a piston in place. Uh, this is the autogram uh, just before the operation. And the first thing what you take away is uh, during the surgery, this is the stopping procedure. It's clear you can let it inside. Perhaps you have then uh, yeah, problems with the, with the disequilibrium or vertigo. Then you open uh, the, the skin and you put here the five screws, these four screws, and one is for the dynamic reference space. The dynamic reference space is important, and especially that the navigation control, uh, navigation system control the robot system. Here you look about uh, the screws that is in exact. Uh, position uh, and uh, here was this important medical engineer this is a semi-automatic uh, segmentation it's not completely automatic segmentation to look where is the best way the trajectory in this uh, during the search here you see the facial nerve monitoring here you see, you see the axios camera this is for the navigation system here you put the dynamic reference space and here we discuss again about the trajectory what is the best way you have uh, three peers in fact uh, and then we discuss then especially to know exactly the different uh, way and especially the distance to the facial nerve and it's clear at the beginning you make also uh, a registration this is important to look about the accuracy the precision uh, of uh, the system uh, and then you start and this is a certain task autonomy here you can visualize on the monitor the distance to the facial nerve to the corta tympani and uh, you progress here shortly with thousand round per minute it's not thirty thousand per minute then you make a safety check before you enter the posterior tympanotomy you take away the dynamic reference space you make uh, what I've shown you the XCAT and uh, then uh, we continue again you make this uh, registration again uh, to visualize this and uh, then we continue to make the small steps uh, uh, during the posterior tympanotomy and we control them uh, uh, also with the facial nerve monitoring what you can see here to look about uh, if you have good results that we are not aware inside of going to the facial nerve. And then we put uh, this uh, CI uh, in this one with this uh, guide tube uh, and uh, we drill uh, the bed inside and we take it out. And uh, in this case, uh, we put then, uh, the electrode inside uh, the cochlea. This is uh, how we perform in this case. Uh, and we take here uh, away the guide tube, how we can see it. Huh? And, this, uh, and it is clear at the beginning uh, we have uh, yeah, we have not had a, a result, good results during the surgery. Sometimes you have air inside the fluid, etc. And uh, we have uh, then after the operation, we perform also a CT scan or the decon beam CT to visualize this. And we have had a good insertion on this side and uh, we have also had a good result in this case. Good. Now to our study conclusion, uh, we have had, uh, we have now 12 patients. Uh, yeah, the uh, feasibility is uh, possible. It's still, we have open question about uh, the court of facial recess, the time 
um, when you take away all the security is clear, perhaps you can perform this in two hours is possible. Uh, what we have seen is now uh, Antwerp group, then is Bern, is Vienna, that I think I performed six cases, Düsseldorf, Brussels, Montpellier, and I think last week Oslo. I'm not about uh, sure about uh, the number, but what I know from Masut is between uh, 50 and 60 cases now in uh, Europe. <laughs> For the future is the question about the two port approaches, if this is possible uh, for, uh, to get in also an endoscope uh, or make a total surgery or only concentrate on the last step, this means uh, a partial robotic assisted surgery to make for hearing preservation a surgery. Another possibility is also for the future to, uh, to better have results is perhaps the, the CT imaging uh, with this new photon counting detector. A general conclusion, uh, these are the robots are promising, it's clear, implication of small endoscope uh, also in the future. The question is also remain a keyhole procedure or a mastoidectomy, a total robot approach or only a partial robotic uh, approach was is performed until now by IOTA motion. And it is clear the regulatory economic issue, the reimbursement uh, must be performed and the clinical usefulness. Thank you very much. And I open for question. Thank you so much, Professor Karasaccio for this uh, not only comprehensive uh, journey through, through robotics and otology, but also through history. Um, we have one question in the chat. It's for you, but uh, maybe Professor Topsa could also give his opinion um, after you because it's it's the question is: Do you have any problems in electrode array migration movements after insertion while pulling out the insertion tube? We saw that in some of your videos. So once removing uh, the insertion tube, is there any migration happening on the electrode? I think it uh, it could be possible. I agree with uh, when you look about the the yeah with the video etc. It could be uh, the one or two electrodes is not so clear because we have not completely controlled. But we see the same uh, that uh, you pull back a little bit. Uh, in other cases, I've also seen with Robotol one time that uh, also with Robotol you have not a completely because you have this clamp, et cetera, it must be the same what I have heard also from the US. Also, sometimes when you put it in, then you have some resistance, then you must put it back, et cetera. I think this remain a problem, but also in the future, because when you need, then it's like a push on to close completely and go away. And uh, mm -hmm. that's what I think it, uh, but it must be perhaps one electrode, but not in each case, but perhaps uh, Vedat can, could also uh, uh, say something about this, I don't know. No, no, I fully agree. And, and thank you for a really very comprehensive overview. It's very enjoyable to see uh, what has been performed before and where we are right now. And to come back to that delicate step, uh, yes, it's technically possible, but we've also seen you take away the piston, you know, we play tape is pistons. You have to be careful and in an unattentive moment, this could happen, but if you take care of it, um, I have to say it was not a big, big issue, but it technically could happen. Uh, um, I mean, yeah, you also see that it happens because we immediately perform a post-operative comb beam CT. Um, I don't think that was the problem, but I have to say yeah, it was one case where we could not really have a full insertion. And, and then, yeah, there is no time to also adjust that trajectory or manipulate in the depth. Uh, that's a of a problem when you have a little bit of inaccuracy. That's a bigger problem than dealing with the, uh, let's say, uh, insertion tube to take away. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's another question. How frequently intraoperative CBCTs are used for navigation? and electrovisualization during CI surgeries? I can say normally we don't use it uh, when uh, only in children, but where we have young children, because until now for the fitting strategy, we still use CT scan. And when we have uh, small children until <clears throat> five, six years, instead to make post-operatively uh, a CT scan we do during the surgery. Do you mean after the surgery, make a cone beam CT directly in the OR? Like this, we have the results. Perhaps in the future, it is not more necessary. We can all 
everything based on impedance, uh, but until now we use it, uh, you, especially during children. In adults, you can perform this uh, later on, uh, several days later. Thank you. Okay, we don't have any further questions and it's 4 p.m. Um, once again, thank you so much, both of you, for, um, for sharing your, your um, uh, enormous experience in this field and uh, all the findings. Um, I would like just to ask participants if we can switch on the camera just shortly and have the digital virtual group picture together. Um, so please switch on your cameras. This is a tradition that we are trying to maintain. And the video you saw in the beginning actually came from uh, one of those pictures. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I encourage you all, um, our, our uh, participants here, to uh, look for all the, the publications that were cited throughout this, um, this session, because there are a lot covering many different topics, um, all the, the cases treated with Hiero, auto plan um, uh, validations and, and many, many more. Um, once again, thank you, Professor Kavasacha. Thank you, Professor Topsakal for your, for your time um, and your presentations. And I would like to invite you all um, for our next experts online session, which is in two weeks, where we will have the topic of microphone directionality. Uh, Peter Nob will be the moderator and we will have speakers, uh, Verena Müller and Anita Oblitska. Thank you all, and I wish you a pleasant rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Thank you very much. It was enjoyable. Ciao, Marco. Ciao. Later. Ciao.